Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you here today at Groveland Evangelical Free Church and to share the word together um, with me as we learn things, learn things together from the Bible and from each other. Um, you need to put your sort of spiritual seat belts on today because uh, you're going to get a fire hose of information and I'm, I'm trying to get it down to a stream that uh, will make sense for you that's uh, you know, acceptable, but there's so many things I'd like to say in this, uh, in this last session, and we'll just see, we'll just see how we do. By the way, uh, let me make sure my mic's on here. There we go, okay. <clears throat> um, we're, t we're talking about the future here, and, you know, no one knows the future completely except for God. He knows the future, and so we love him for that and we thank him that he knows the future but this is kind of a tough subject so uh, all we can do is make the best decisions that we can at the time with the information that we have for our lives right and the bible is a good guide for us in that but i know some of you are going to have different opinions and maybe you came from a church history or a church tradition where there was different views in this i would love to have this discussion with you maybe clarify some things whoops or i think there's a little a little alien somewhere in that uh, Maybe it's me. Yeah, it's me. That's what I usually say to Carol. It's me. It's not you. Yeah, I think it's probably a little wire going into the mic, so I'll just stand as still as I can. Yeah. Anyway, if you have questions or I can clarify some of the things I'm saying, these are, these are weird and they're out in the future and the world has never experienced some of the things we're talking about. So um, keep your mind open to that and let's, let's have a dialogue if you do have questions. And here we are in the, in the time of uh, the world where there's supposed to be peace and the Olympics are going on and yet there's saber rattling in the Ukraine and who knows, a war could even start during the Olympics. One of the commentators was saying that the other night. They're afraid of these kinds of things. But of course, only... God is in control of history. Amen? Amen? Amen. And so that gives us peace. But one day, he's going to interrupt history. And he's going to reach down and snatch the Christians out. It's not me. This is the Bible telling us this. And then there's going to be real chaos on the earth. And for a seven-year period called the tribulation, there's going to be real trouble here. Now, is God going to destroy the world during that time? No. He loves the world. And he loves the people in it. For God so loved the world that he gave us his son and that we could have forgiveness through him and have eternal life. And so God's goal, of course, is to restore the world. And uh, he has to evict a rotten tenant on the way out, and that's the devil, who's really got making trouble down on the earth during these days, as we all know. And that's one thing that I'm hoping that this little sheet of paper that you got, a little insert, that you can leave in a, in a strategic place if uh, the rapture happens in our lifetimes and we're taken out, this will explain a lot of things for other people. It sort of lays out what that track looks like from my point of view and a lot of other evangelicals um, it, for the biblical sort of future. Now in January, the last couple of weeks, we were talking about Jesus words as he was talking about wars and rumors of wars there would be false teachers there would be famine there would be weather disruptions there would be israel would get back together as a nation he predicted all those things have happened and so uh, how should we live now based on what these things we've learned about um, from the word of god what should we pay attention to and so i thought on this last session if you want to take your outline and follow along we can look at i only have time for three points today there's a few sub points but the first one is this the trends that are going on around us right now in the world in 2022 good and bad what are the trends that we see around us in the world um, right now some good and some bad if you have a bible you can turn to daniel chapter 12 daniel <clears throat> chapter 12. Again, if you open your Bible in the middle, you're probably right at the Psalms. Take a right. You're going to go past the big books like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then you'll come to Daniel. If you go to Hosea, you went a block too far. Turn around, come back a block, and there you'll find Daniel um, right there. But the trends that we're discussing today and that are around us are moving faster, faster than ever. And we'll look at these four under, under this section of trends here and uh, see what we have. The first sub-point today, or the first trend we'll look at, is an explosion of knowledge. An explosion of knowledge. 
Revelation 11 says the time in the future will be when everyone in the world will see an event at the same time. That was laughable when John wrote this in the first century. No one thought it was possible for that. It had to be a future prediction. And it's obvious now that we see that. Revelation 13 says that one day there'll be a worldwide currency. Also seemed pretty ridiculous. And we're getting closer and closer to that with the way the world is digitizing money. And now look in Daniel chapter 12. And I want to read um, starting at verse 3. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens. And those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, close up and seal the words of this scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. Or it might be translated, knowledge will increase. Another version says, uh, travel and education will accelerate. Now, this is, that's the understatement of the century, isn't it? I mean, we can see uh, tell, uh, technologically... Uh, innovations and stuff around is just adv- uh, accelerating at a ridiculous speed. It's so fast now that the knowledge gained in the world that no one can really, can really keep track of it. In fact, uh, this chart here shows you the way knowledge increased from 1440 to 1900. Knowledge doubled about every 400 years. So it took 400 years for man to know nice, twice as much as he knew uh, in the period before. And then from 1900 to 1950, it went down to just 50 years, they doubled their knowledge. And then up to 1970, it was 20 years. And then in the 80s, 10 years. By the aughts, it was eight years. By 2017, it was 13 months. And now it's less than a year. And IBM predicts in a couple of years that knowledge will double every day. You want to write that down in the little blank that I put there in the outline. You can keep track um, of these statistics. You could check this out yourself if you want online. And knowledge is growing like that and that and that. And You know, it's weird for me because it feels like my brain is shrinking all the time. <laughs> and yet knowledge around us is growing all the time. You feel sort of left behind like that yourself? And all the gadgets that we have are, are, are getting faster and cheaper and smaller and it's hard to keep up with all those changes. Changes is weird. It's always been weird. You know, go back to the iron horse. When the steam engine came out, nobody wanted to give up horses, and yet they did. And go to the elevator. When people did, they were going upstairs, and all of a sudden they were riding in this thing that was going up and down, and they didn't really trust it. And then, I mean, I remember in my lifetime, FM radio. Cassette tapes. Big news. (laughs) Power windows in cars, you know. Hey, we got a microwave. It's 1975. That was a big deal. And you think the internet is a big deal? You haven't seen any. The next 20 years are going to be massively disruptive in the world with the way knowledge and technology is accelerating and changing. It's called the IoT or the, what does it mean? The Internet of Things. And also artificial intelligence, AI. And they're they're growing so fast and they're changing the world for good in many ways. Think about the millennium. When Christ is going to come back and rule on earth, and, the, and the, the inventions that we have now for health and for convenience and for safety are going to be a thousand times better than they are now, and Christ is going to rule in a, one, rule in a wonderful time in the world. So, you know, I, I'm an optimist. I'm looking ahead past a very disruptive time, the tribulation, when God has to uproot a very rotten um, tenant, like I described him, the devil. And get him out, because this is not his planet. Christ came back, and in his death on the cross, redeemed the planet itself and sort of took it back. But, uh, you know, in the meantime, we've got all this trouble now, but, but still technology is growing and growing and growing. It's estimated now, if you want to write this down in the little blank in your outline, there are 50 billion devices now globally connected to each other, talking to each other. Or we're talking about cell phones, PCs, mainframes, the cloud, search engines, stuff like that. You know, get this, pretty soon more information will be gathered by machines than will be gathered by human beings. That's kind of scary. The U.S. Patent Office says that the applications for patents is completely out of control. 
There are so many ideas for inventions and for new things. So, you know, we hear about the wars and the trouble and the pain and the problems, but there, there are good things happening in the world, too, in terms of inventions. And all these inventions and these technologies, they're not immoral. They're not bad. They're amoral. They could be used for good or for bad. And in the future, they're going to be used for both. Sorry to say. Alvin Toffler, I don't know if, I better not sit in the stool or this thing will start crackling again. <laughs> it's probably the bones in my back, you know, I bend over. <laughs> anyway, Alvin Toffler, who wrote the book Future Shock in, in the 1970s, was looking way ahead. He was a futurist and really a brilliant thinker. And uh, in the book, he described the people that are going to be left behind in the future. And he said the ones that are going to be left behind are those that can't learn and then unlearn, and then relearn stuff. Isn't it true? You learned how to use a rotary phone, and then a princess phone, and then you had a cell phone bigger than a shoebox. Now, you know, I listen to my phone through my hearing aids all the time. The iPads and the music and the messages all come through, through that. So the change is, change is like that. It happens so fast, and you have to adjust. Think back to some of the things that were left behind. Blockbuster video. Where's that? It's gone, right? Kodak, Radio Shack, Tower Records, Oldsmobiles. <laughs> when was the last time you saw a phone booth? How about the companies that make phone books? Mailboxes. The, the, the world's changed. And, and the things that we thought would always be there permanently are not there. And I'll tell you, a church that doesn't stay relevant and connected to its community is really going to be in trouble in the future. Jesus was a trendsetter, wasn't he? He was a disruptor. In fact, he was so disruptive that the religious establishment tried to kill him. The best religious people in the country, they did not want change and they tried to give, they were afraid of change. We're all afraid of change sometimes. I told you a few months ago about, about a bumper sticker I saw, it said, change is great, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> See, we all want the change to be there if it's good, but we don't want to be the one to go first. No. And the world is changing fast. We're standing in a river of information. The average person uses their phone five hours a day. I read a bunch on that. That's a conservative estimate. I'm, I'm guilty of it. I mean, I'm talking to people like you, okay, <laughs> on the phone all the time. But the world is, is clustering tighter and tighter together. And uh, that's what's painful about this. Another slide I've got up there shows a picture of a couple. And this is kind of funny, but it's also... <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's kind of sad, too, because that's what the world has come to. You go, I went to a restaurant not long ago, and almost everyone in there was on their phone. Maybe they were doing important things. Maybe their food was coming late. But I thought, what's the world coming to? And so I checked my phone, and, you know, no, I shouldn't have been doing that, but, you know. So on your phone now, what do we do? We talk, we message, we email, you can get maps on your phone, you can get your altitude, you can do your banking, you can do your investing, you can take your blood pressure, you can check Facebook. I did all that stuff yesterday. And that's just a few things. Fill in the blank if you want to. There are nearly three million different ways you can use your iPhone now or your Samsung phone. They even got phones that fold in half. They're going to have phones pretty soon that look like a capital C that will actually bend over in a, in a C shape, crescent shape. I don't know how they do it or how it works, but I just saw that online. So there's all that, uh, all that weird information and all those things going on at the same time. Three million ways you can... It's almost as many combinations as there are Starbucks coffee combinations. <laughs> right? No, I think there's only like, what is it, 57,000 Starbucks combinations? Yeah. I think it's, that's a small number compared to 3 million. But anyway, think of all those things I just said about change and then enter Bitcoin and crypto because that's the new player on finance. So what is Bitcoin? Let's look for a minute at Bitcoin's bit and crypto because the word cryptocurrency actually 
didn't even exist 20 years ago. There was no such word. Crypto comes from where we get cryptography. And the cryptic encoding is necessary for the process that they use to make the coins and to record the transactions, stuff like that. The making of, I'm not going to get into the makeup of how they build um, and mine the, the coins and make it, because there's a lot of math involved in that. I don't want to bore you with all that. But imagine a tiny bank inside your phone. That's Bitcoin. So you get a digital wallet, you apply and you get, an, you get an account number, and now you have a digital wallet. And you can use that digital wallet to buy Bitcoin and store it in your digital wallet. And then you can use that to exchange your Bitcoin for purchases. And you can do it in different places around the world. Now, some countries ignore Bitcoin. They're just not saying anything about it. Other countries outlaw it. And they're not letting you do anything with it. China recently had really, and now they've eased up a little bit. I don't know. And then there are other countries that, that, that welcome it. But I tell you, it's here to stay. You cannot uninvent something where there are 300 million transactions. No, no, wait, wrong statistic. 300,000 transactions every single day with Bitcoin now. And that's going up and up with people buying and selling and exchanging it. Now, it's used for crime, too, because the criminals, they use it for ransomware to hold companies, you know, steal their programs and stuff. But the IRS can trace those Bitcoin transactions. And so it's taxable. My sister-in-law works, has worked for the IRS and now works for H&R Block. She told us how they can track this stuff. So there is a way to legitimize it, but the government's kind of scared of it because it's getting so big and kind of out of control. It's still, there are a lot of unknowns out there about it. But this is the evolution of money. Think about, we started with exchanging one guy's axe was more valuable than another guy's axe, and then they discovered metals, and then it was gold, and then it went to coins, and then it went to paper money, then it went to checkbooks, then it was credit cards, and now you got the bell curve. And all of these had a bell curve in it. You've seen a bell curve, it goes like this, up, and then back down. So the first 10% adopt something immediately, as quick as they can. That's the early adapters for Bitcoin. And then there's the 80% that eventually go with it, you know, okay, they're in. And then there's the last 10%, I will never get a Bitcoin, I'm never going to do that, or I'm never going to get a Tesla, or I'm never going to skydive, or whatever, you know. It's, they're never going to change. By the way, you can't let those people run your church, because <laughs> they'll hold you back. The world is changing. We don't change the gospel, amen? But the way we present it to people, you have to be flexible and open. Um, you know, if I was going to add a beatitude, it would be, blessed are the flexible, for they shall bend and not break. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's kind of the way uh, life has gotten. Anyway, I'm a little off the subject there, but, but the point is, Bitcoin is, is built, it's built on a structure called blockchain, Okay? And uh, there's a lot of complications, again, in the structure of that. Let me just say that the blockchain, uh, it can be used for much more than just Bitcoin and for digital, digital currencies. But blockchain allows super fast computers to talk to each other all around the world very quickly. And so that will verify your account and the amount of, of Bitcoin value that you have in there and your purchase. And there's no government involved at all with any of it until taxable time comes, of course, like I said. So Bitcoin has some advantages because if inflation goes crazy, well, you know, it will hold its value um, a little bit better. In, in fact, uh, Venezuela, there was a crash in their currency 2014, and it got worse and worse and worse. And by 2020, when Bitcoin was circulating pretty, in a pretty popular way, thousands of families in Venezuela and other Latin American countries exchanged their currencies to Bitcoin and they were saved from being financially ruined because it, the currency was devaluating in inflation and theirs was staying the same amount with Bitcoin. So I, I don't even understand it all. And a lot of people say, I'm not going to get that because I don't understand everything about it. But you know, you don't understand exactly how your phone works. You don't understand how the internet works, but there's still value to it. So the 80% will eventually move closer and understand more about it. I'm not predicting the future here. I'm just saying what possibilities are that are out there. By the way, here's a, here's a picture of a Bitcoin machine. This is six blocks from my house at a power market, which is the same as uh, like a 7-Eleven. 
And I went in there just wondering what was in that store. I was on a three-mile walk, and so I was checking out the new stores, and I, there's a Bitcoin machine in there. And I went over to it, and it's about, this would be about floor level down here. So it's probably six feet tall. Here's the triple eight number that you call if you've got questions. Cash to Bitcoin. And you, you know, you, you put your, your paper money in there or your credit card in there, and you put a number in you, your account, and you get back a little uh, printout, and it's got a number on there, and that's your Bitcoin number for, that has the value, whatever the, what your, your purchase is that you made. So, you know, you, you can make those purchases. Now, there's way more to it than what I just told you. I'm really simplifying this, but if you haven't heard anyone describe this to you before, that's, that's a little bit of it, about it. I'm not saying that you should invest in it or that you should buy it. It's a very volatile investment. There are stocks out there and the stock exchanges that, uh, that are, people have raised capital to get these companies going, and some have gotten wildly high. Um, but I would say that digital currencies are here to stay. And the U.S. government is going to be involved in it. And so it's just too big to ignore now. It's just, it's, it's too big. You know, there are about 200 currencies around the world. None of them can do what Bitcoin can do because people in Vietnam can trade with people in China or in Chile or in Minneapolis or anywhere. And, um, you know, if, if, you're, if you're the poor people, often their family lives in another country and they can use Bitcoin to exchange the wages that they made and send it safely and quickly and there's no exchange amount or anything needed for that. And so they've adapted to this very quickly. In El Salvador, actually, this is now accepted as a currency. In the country of El and other countries are, are right behind them. So Bitcoin is just one way that knowledge is exploding and accelerating uh, across the world. I took maybe a little too much time on that, but Bitcoin could crash, actually. It could, it could go away. But the idea of digital money, I think, is not going to go away. I'll have a few more thoughts on that in a little bit. Let's look at another trend, because we looked at knowledge exploding and also Bitcoin. How about this third one, a weakened church? A weakened church. Matthew, if you want to turn to Matthew chapter 24, <clears throat> this is a parallel passage to what Jesus was telling us in Mark 13 a couple of weeks ago. But in Matthew 24, he he is talking about the end of the age, signs that are going on around in the world. And now he says a few things about the church, starting in verse 9. Verse 9 down to verse 13, 14, I think is about the church. This is Jesus speaking. Then you, he's talking to his disciples and Christians, will be handed over to be persecuted, to be put to death. And you will be hated by all the nations. Why? Because of me. Christians identify with Jesus. That's the church. Verse 10, at that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Verse 12, because of the increase in wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. He's talking about most Christians. Hard for us to believe when we read that. We all want revival. Look at verse 13. Excuse me. <clears throat> but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel, related to the church, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. And Jesus is talking there about the 144,000 because after the rapture and Christians are taken out, it's going to be 144,000 Jews that are going to accept Christ and become his apostles and his evangelists all around the world. And millions of people will accept Christ and feel bad that they missed the rapture. And then they get it. It's too late, but they can still know Christ. They're probably going to have to die for their faith. Revelation 7 and 14, if you want to look more information up on the 144,000. That's chasing a little rabbit here. We don't have time for that right now. But the point here in this text is that Christians are going to stop following God's way. And we're seeing this decline in the church right now. You know, the church used to be about a, a social connection. You, your business friends went to the church and you met people from school or from university or your neighborhood that went to the same church. And, and, you know, if you knew someone at work, you maybe even talked about work there a little bit. And, you know, kids would get confirmed there. And Sunday was kind of a sacred, a sacred thing. You know, it just seems like that's out the window now. 
People don't respect Sunday as, as the Lord's day doesn't seem anymore, right? And so, the, you know, the weddings now and funerals are on the beach or they're at a golf course. I mean, I mean uh, in respect to the Scott family, you know, and we're praying for Joanne and the family. It was a lovely thing that so many people gathered to have sacred moments, to remember Daryl's life and have that time here yesterday. It's getting more and more unusual. People want to commune with nature. Or they, want to, they don't want to have God maybe as much involved in the passing of life anymore. Or even, like I said, with weddings. Uh, Little League now is on Sunday. And so, well, you know, we can't be at church because we got our games on Sunday or the soccer leagues for kids are on Sunday, Saturday and also Sunday sometimes, you know, and businesses are open now on Sunday. And so, hey, I got to work on Sunday. So I really can't be there for church, you know. You know, the big NFL game is this Sunday at church. So it's, it's not at church. So I'll be at home watching the game or I got this RV now and, you know, I got to go across it. You know, in 1900, there weren't any of those things competing with the church. And now they're all realities in our world. And so some of it's just math. People are just choosing to do other things and there's less people at church. Plus some churches are real dogmatic and they're judgmental and people come and they, sent, they just sniff that out and they go, these, these people are kind of, you know, strict and everything. I, I just want to meet Jesus. And they come across like Pharisees. Even Jesus had trouble with people like that, religious people like that. And then there, on the other extreme, there are those that are so liberal, they don't even believe that the Bible is the word of God anymore. They don't believe Jesus is the son of God. And they may endorse gay pastors and other things that the Bible speaks about. They, they stand for these laws that say a man and a woman, it's more than that that we should have for marriage laws. And the Bible goes, no. These are, these are, you know, uh, guidelines for life that God gave. It's not anybody's opinion, but people don't respect God as much anymore for, for the way they live their life. And then the Roman Catholics have their scandal with the priests, and that's heard for many years. And then COVID hits, and now the statistics tell us that over a third of the church is not going to come back ever again. There's also internet scams and there's religious scams that pull people away from the church. Last week, I had a verse up there from 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3. And there were 18 adjectives in there. Do you remember? It was those that they lover of themselves and conceited and they have a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. And they're rash and selfish and uh, many other things. That it was kind of a snapshot actually of the way you look at some of the some of the things that are, we see on the horizon right now. So it's an uphill battle for the church. We need to pray for revival, like we were talking about last week. Well, quickly, let's go to the next one because I'm trying to get through all these. Point D is this, Satan is strengthening. The church is weakening, and on the other hand, Satan is strengthening. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5 that Satan prowls around like a devil, or, or like a lion, the devil, the devil does that. First, First John chapter two, fifteen to seventeen, warn us about the life in the world, and how Satan can use the 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 you know the the urges that we have with the temptation of the eyes, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh to pull us away. Revelation twelve tells us that Satan is running loose, you know, in the world, making trouble before Christ comes back. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Second Corinthians chapter four. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This is way up in the New Testament after the Gospels. And of course, as the church gets weaker and Satan team, his team gets stronger and stronger, this is, this is a sad thing to see. Did you know that there are satanic chapters all around the United States now? They have over 20,000 members in the church of Satan. The largest chapter is in the city of Detroit. And they, uh, they intend to put a statue up in every major city in the United States. By the way, oddly enough, here is the Ten Commandments being taken out of City Hall where major, major cities and urban areas are being forced to take it away from the uh, civic areas because people go, oh, I'm offended by the Ten Commandments. You can't have that there. And yet they can bring these statues of Satan and stuff and put them up there for display when they have their... There are conferences and things. I think that's uh, 
ironic that, that we would be going down in that sense and the other Satan's team would be going up. The statues that they make of Satan, these are nine feet tall. It costs $100,000 to build these statues. Here's three others that are in three different cities. And notice there's children next to them, looking up, glowingly up at Satan, feeling, I'm safe with him. This is a happy place. This is a good thing for me to be um, next to Satan. And there's a pentagram above him there and all the other symbols of Satan's um, you know, personality and style uh, are involved in this. And of course, the, they're in, interviewed with people when they come to these major cities like Atlanta. And they've been in Seattle and major cities across the country. You can Google this and read the articles yourself. I'm going to show you some more in just a minute. But to quote the people from the, the Church of Satan, they say, we believe that kids, quote, are forced into religion and that religion is very negative of them. So the implication is um, that they're safe with Satan, but they're not if they go to the church and the church and hear about Jesus. So it's Second Corinthians chapter four. Let me turn up to that. I think it's verse four. That says uh, verse three. And even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. Because the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they can't see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Paul says, for we don't preach ourselves, we preach Christ. He says, people are blinded and unbelievers, they they, they just can't see how evil this is. And, And so there's something supernatural going on there. If people who would normally see something that's morally wrong, they just don't see it. Actually, this is getting down into kids' schools and clubs. There's a Satanist school club. And this is, this is so weird. I'm not making this up because my nephew, who is a captain of the fire department in Rock Island, a city of 100,000 people, it's right next to Moline, Illinois, where they make deer tractors, for heaven's sake. This is the heartland of America. Davenport, Iowa, it's the Quad Cities right there. There's this Satan club for kids. And I, I put, he sent this to me saying, Mark, do you believe this? He says, we're trying to stop it, but I put in yellow some of the things. Hey, kids, let's have fun at the after-school Satan club. Parents, your children will learn benevolence and empathy, critical thinking, problem-solving, creative expression, and personal sovereignty. Your child will learn to be sovereign for himself. It also says, this is at the Jane Addams Elementary School. Here's the, I'm not kidding. Here's the date. It's the first, the 13th of January of 2022. This is a couple of weeks ago. And it's going to be again in March, uh, the 10th of March, and also in April, and also in May. And then they're going to do more after this. It's sponsored by the Satanic Temple After School Satan Club. And there's their website. Unbelievable. You didn't think this was possible before. There are chapters of this in many cities across the country. And these people are, they're protesting, they're going to the city hall, they're trying to stop it, and they haven't been able to stop it. There's actually something also called the Devil's Advocate Scholarship, where high schools are giving uh, scholarships to kids when they join the, uh, the satanic club at school. It's the, it's, uh, I have a quote here. Um, It's the after-school club that promotes a positive, secure message for children and students, unquote. That's how they they pitch it. And then, of course, there's the satanic coloring book that you can also get at school now. And you can buy Satan t-shirts for your kids. I'm not making this stuff up. It's out there. And what's sad that while the church is in decline, this is on the rise. And it just seems to fit in with uh, the, the end times, doesn't it? That uh, satanic coloring book is from a CNN article, if you want to Google that and read more of the article yourself. I heard a quote from a movie the other day. It was the bad guy in the end of the movie, and he said this, quote, people have a need to believe anything now, or people have a need to believe nowadays, and they'll believe anything. That was the bad guy actually in Spider-Man, Far From Home, one of the last lines of the movie. I was watching that with Carol the other night, and I thought, that is true. People want to believe in something, 
So they'll believe in anything. And in the vacuum of the church not being there, they'll grasp onto anything. And this looks good to so many of them. What did Jesus call Satan? The father of lies. John chapter 8, verse 44. Make no mistake about it. Satan's goal is to drag as many souls into hell as he possibly can. And it looks like he's winning. You need to keep praying for Pastor Tom. Here he is this weekend up in Hume Lake with 10 junior hires. Trying to help them see why God can make a difference in their life at 13, 14 years old. And at that age, you're starting to make life decisions about, you're forming your worldview. You have to pray for him. And here he struggled for these few years trying to get kids and stay connected to them. And I've watched him do it. I've been in the youth room when there was 20, 22 kids in there. And he's trying to keep a connection with them so that they'll keep believing in God and not give up. And it doesn't work like that for every youth pastor. Hundreds of Christian camps across the Sierra shut down and are never opening up again because of the COVID. The only reason Hume Lake is still going is because at the last minute, a businessman sat down and <laughs> they wrote a check for $8 million. Said, we have to keep this thing going. I was a youth pastor for four years. I wanted to see a group from freshmen through graduation. That place is making a difference. You've got to pray for your youth pastor. He's way more than a youth pastor, by the way. But um, God is still on the throne. Amen? Amen? And the trends around us, they're not all good. But they're powerful. That's just four. I don't have time for any more. Let's go to point two, which is this. The, the coming tyrant. A charming monster. A charming monster. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. If you have a Bible. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Satan... His superman is the Antichrist. He could be alive. He could be alive right now. Moving his way up through the ranks of business or in industry or in politics or something. What is he going to be? He's a counterfeit of Jesus Christ. He's probably going to have an anointing moment where his, his, his stage will, will open up, the curtains will open up, he'll become a powerful leader, just like Jesus, who was anointed and by the Holy Spirit as a baptism and went on to have a powerful ministry. This guy is going to be filled with Satan and he'll have his powerful moment before the world. And he's probably not going to be known until after the rapture happens as the Antichrist. Look in 2 Thessalonians 2, several verses to read here. This is, this is pretty interesting. Um, let's start reading at verse 3. Verse 3 of 2 Thessalonians 2. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for the day of the Lord will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness, that's the Antichrist, is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that's called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. We talked about that two weeks ago. Don't you remember, verse 5, when I was with you, I used to tell you these things, and now you know what is holding him back. Holding him back, him is the Holy Spirit there. So that he, the Antichrist, may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it back, that's the Holy Spirit, will continue to do so until the Antichrist, he, is taken out of the way. And so, or, No, the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way. And then, verse 8, the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. Verse 9. The coming of the lawless one, Antichrist, will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Here's the kicker, verse 11. For this reason, God sends a powerful delusion so that they won't be able to believe and they'll believe Satan's lie. Greek here literally says 
a, a lie so strong that they won't be able to believe it. That perfectly describes the Antichrist, that chapter. And there are other places, Revelation and Daniel, where the Antichrist is described. We don't have time to look at all those. But this guy's going to have a lot of charm. He'll have people skills like you can't believe. He's going to be a trustable leader. People are going to go, what a guy. This is a wonderful guy. <laughs> He's going to be the one that throws the ball out at the World Series, and he'll be at Le Mans and drop the flag, and he'll be at the Olympics, and he'll be very popular. It's like you see the people sort of cheering on the screen. He'll have a Facebook page. He'll be on 60 Minutes. But Revelation 12 says even Israel is going to trust him. Now I want you to turn your Bible to Revelation chapter 6. Turn to Revelation chapter 6. Because although he'll be popular, halfway through the tribulation, it's going to be a little different story. Because he's going to gain a stronghold of financial power. And we see the way finances are coming now together digitally. Revelation 13 says that this guy will be a monster. As he's like Satan in a man. And he's going to twist the knife in and and make even more pain on people. Revelation 6 describes some of what he'll do in verse 5 and 6. When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come! And I looked, and there before me was a black horse, and its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. And then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures say, A quart of wheat for a day's wages, and three quarts of barley for a day's wages. And don't damage the oil or the wine. Now this is a weird passage, but actually it's saying that in the future there's a financial crash that's coming. The economies are going to collapse, and inflation is going to go crazy, because it's saying here that it's going to take a day's wage to buy one day's worth of food. That's what it's saying, a quart of wheat for a day's wages. Now, if you make $100 a day, it's going to cost $100 a day just to feed your family. And then it says something also here about... Uh, not damaging the oil or the wine. And of course, oil and the wine are the luxury foods, and they're not going to be touched at this point in the picture. Of course, that's probably the 1%. who are still going to be rising above it all. They'll be okay. But the general population is really going to be struggling with these things. Now look at verses 7 and 8, where it says... Um, by the way, your version may say a quart of barley instead of a quart of wheat. Does it say that? And barley was what the poor people ate because it's what they get, used for animal food. And so now poor people are having, all the people are having to go down to what animal food is. It's like you having to eat dog food because prices have gotten so expensive. Except for the 1%, they're still okay right now. But look at verse 7. And, eight. and then the Lamb opened up the fourth seal, and I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked, and there before me was a pale horse, and its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. And they were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by the sword and famine and plague and by the wild beasts of the earth. So obviously that's a massive pandemic that's going to hit, and the world will come out of, be, just be out of control. And they're going to ask the Antichrist, come and rescue us, rescue us. But in chapter 13, you look in chapter 13, look in verse 11 where it says, Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns, but he spoke like a dragon. And this is the Antichrist. And it says later on in that chapter, I think it's verse 16, he forced, or 15, he was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that it could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. He also forced everyone, small and rich, great and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or his forehead so that no one could buy or sell anything unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast, the number of his name. This calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for this is man's number, his number, is six, six, six. So Satan is going to come in. This, this uh, false prophet and the Antichrist are described here working hand in hand. We'll go, you can go deeper into that passage if you want to read those verses again. 
but it's saying they're just kind of like evil twins working together. The false prophet doing miracles and saying, that's your guy. You better follow the Antichrist and worship him. And he's going to force people to worship him and to show loyalty to him. And he's going to give a mark. And you're going to have to have that mark if you're going to want to buy and sell. It's not me. It's what the Bible is saying. And it's going to separate God's followers from the Antichrist's fall. Even the 1% at this point are going to have to be in on it. He's going to say, my way or the highway. And you're going to have to buy and sell according to what I say. I remember the first time I went to Winco. I love Winco. <laughs> I buy my bulk stuff there. They seem to have everything. And the first time I went there was in Ventura. And I was so excited. And I was gathering all these things. And I got up to the belt where you put the stuff and it moves up to the cash register. And I pulled out my credit card and Lay said, well, we don't take credit cards. You got to have a debit card or cash because Winco's a co op. That's how they keep their prices low. You should try Winco if you haven't been there. Anyway, I was really embarrassed because all this food was piled on the, on the belt there and I couldn't pay. And I just, you know, it was awkward. I, I just I had to leave and I felt terrible. And I ran out and got my credit card and went and got more stuff. And then I've, I mean, my debit card and I've, I made a purchase and I've been a loyal fan ever since. But when I was going out to get the other card, I was thinking, that's what it's going to be like with the Antichrist. People are going to have food. They're going to come up. And, well, you can't make a purchase. You can't buy that house. You can't buy that gasoline. You can't get that food. You can't make that payment for uh, school or anything. You, you know, the, you can't pay any of your bills. And the technology is here to make that happen. It works even now. Sometimes we use our phone, don't we, to wave it over something. You go to Costco to pay for gas, you just tap the little card. In Sweden now, they've got thousands of, many thousands of people on chips that they have in their hands, the size of a grain of rice. You know where they put it? Go back one slide, Doug. They put it in the top of their hand so that when you wave your hand, come on, there you go, you wave your hand over the scanner, it just picks up all the information in that chip. And it's a grain of rice is pretty small, right? You can see how small it is here. But this is an old slide. I'm going to show you something in a minute that is even smaller because they're putting chips now in Alzheimer's patients and also in the sky pet. So some people think, go back one slide, Doug. I'm sorry, it's my mistake. But this, the mark of the beast might also be a barcode scan. If you've ever been to Disneyland, they stamp your hand and you can't see it. But then when you come in, you've got to put your hand underneath and they can see the infrared and then you can get in. It might be something like that where only a reader will pick up what's on your hand. And you can see the way on the right, he's twisting his skin and it doesn't affect the, the implant that's that's put on your hand. That would be painless to put that on. But the next slide is even creepier because this is what the new chips look like. That little tiny black dot on the person's thumb. You know how much information is in that little dot? Two to the 128th power of numerical combinations. That's a number bigger than you can... And you get a 38 number RFID uh, ID card, and that goes on that card, opens that, opens that little tiny chip up, which has all this information. They're using these chips now for Alzheimer patients, because if they wander away from the facility, they have no way to find them, and so they can just read it and check it, and well, there they are in the GPS, go down the street and bring them back for safety. It's a good thing. Sky Pet, we've had Sky Pet, and our dog, we had a dog for many years, we had Sky, you put the chip in there and you can GPS, where's Penny? Oh, there she is. She's chasing the bus down the freeway. See, you see her on my phone there. <laughs> and so, you know, these things, you can see the evolution of how it's going um, from one place to another. Elon Musk, he wants to put chips in everybody. In a way, I'm kind of okay with that. I mean, I put chips in myself all the time. Barbecue chips, potato chips, <laughs> fish and chips, all kinds of chips. Well, like, it's a joke, Okay. <laughs> I also read this week about a guy who, uh, he lost his Bitcoin account. And so he lost his money. Because if you don't have your number, you can't get access to your money. And it's gone. And it was hundreds of thousands of dollars. And another guy I read about online he, in Iceland, he actually had his Bitcoin account put on a chip and put in his hand. And now it's always there. Do you see how this is coming? 
We thought these other technology things in past years was impossible, and now they're common everyday things of life, and this is just kind of the way life is going. So 666, the mark, it could be tied to digital currency. And in 2021, maybe you know last year, 135 nations met and agreed. They all agreed on a universal tax around the world. Every 135 countries. You see, it's just a matter of time until the world comes together with this. We're coming closer because there's massive world debt and a digital, a new digital currency across the world. They could clean the slate and say, all that debt is gone. We're starting with a new digital currency. Everybody's on board. You can't use your cash paper money anymore. And by the way, we're going to give everybody $2,000 added to your account just to sweeten the deal and get you on the bandwagon. They've been giving us free money for a couple of years now. Who's paying for it? That money has to be paid for. The U.S. debt is way out of... I think we're the worst relative to GDP of, any, GDP of any country in the world for debt now. And so this is kind of where we're going because people are... They're already used to using paper money less because of the, the way paper money is, can be dirty. You go into stores and people didn't want to get change back from somebody else with COVID. I was in a very expensive, exclusive store the other day buying some very high-class things. It was a Dollar Tree. <laughs> and, um, yeah. And uh, I asked the cashier, I just said, you know, uh, what percentage of your transactions are, are cash? She said, well, they're almost all cards now. And I said, it's just proof that that's kind of the way we're going, you know. Listen, if you buy... Bitcoin, or you, there's nothing in the Bible that says Bitcoin is wrong or it's no good. And if you, if you have these digital things, you're not accepting the mark of the beast or anything like that. The mark of the beast is something that you are, when you get it, you're going to consciously know and you're going to be aware that you're denying Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life because religion and economy are going to be tied together. We just read about it here, where it's the... Antichrist is going to make it, a, 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 make it, that's the deal. And you're going to have to accept it. And I think it'll be, as the scripture says, after we're taken out of the way. So, you know, this is not investment advice. I'm not an expert in any of this stuff. I'm just looking at the trends. But I think when the digital currency comes, it's going to be way more advanced when the Antichrist is here than we see right now in the little teeny booth that I saw at the store down the street from me the way knowledge is increasing so fast. You know, I want to show you that video again real quick, just to remind you. Let me make sure this is, there we go. Um, and the point of the video is, you know, are you ready? We plan for a lifetime, but we live as though Christ was coming today. Because just like that pastor dropped that Bible and disappeared, that could happen today. Nothing else has to happen before the rapture. We don't have to have the temple built or the Antichrist to appear or Bitcoin or any of that. Any moment, Christ can come back and we need to live ready. That's why you need tactics. Look at the third thing as we finish today. And thank you for your patience for a few extra minutes. Tactics, you need them as we finish. How should we live? Because see, the, the world has changed. We're not going back to the way it was before. There's too many signs, I think, that have actually occurred to say that it was a false alarm and Jesus is going to undo it all with all the things going on around us. So we're in a war and you need strategy in a war. And so the first thing is this, read your Bible. You need to be reading your B-I-B-L-E. And the next slide gives us a shot of what you can uh, remember, because B-I-B-L-E stands for basic instruction before, what? Leaving earth. And we're all going to leave earth one day, and why not have the right instruction? So, you know, this is what, sometimes when I don't have a lot of time, for, I can do this in 15 minutes. You could just take five minutes to just read some scripture. And then just, and, and maybe the daily bread, but the scripture really is the best. And then five minutes to just meditate on what you just read. And then just five minutes, Steve, you, more is better, but even five minutes to pray. And I like to add um, deep breathing in with the meditation because it really lets you slow down and listen to what God is saying. Anyone could take just a few minutes and do that every day. Just, just start with that. Or the daily bread, read that and pray. But, but you've got to get your head into the Bible. 
And that becomes a filter to help you face all the crud that we see in the world these days. You know, you, you can read books like um, Ephesians where we're told to arm ourselves with the power of God or Matthew 6 where a lot of great truth there. That leads me to the next one, point B. Put your issues in His hands. We struggle with issues. All of us have those things. God never intended for you to carry those alone. He says, you know, Peter said, cast your cares upon me. And Jesus also tells us, you know, seek first the kingdom of God. He takes care of the birds and the grass. He'll take care of you. Don't worry. It's okay to be concerned. It's not right to be worried. Lean not on your own understanding. Trust in the Lord. The third thing, we get power from purity. Our power comes from purity. I wanted to take time to read this. I don't have time to read the text later. You look up 1 John chapter 2 and chapter 3. And there's a phrase in there that says, we should live pure so we can be confident and unashamed at his coming because he is coming back. And don't you want to be confident and unashamed when Christ returns? I know you do. I know you do. Why don't you put your books and papers away now? We're going to prepare for communion. But while we're preparing, <clears throat> let me tell you sort of a little closing thought. In 1967, I was in um, Austria, and I was there with a Christian organization, and the guy there was talking about the, the end times and Christ coming back. And it was the first time I'd ever heard any of this stuff. And uh, he was talking about the Antichrist and the... the uh, you know, the tribulation and the millennium and what those things meant. I was 15, very impressionable. And it was two weeks of this. And it really hit me. And here I was in the middle of Austria, a wonderful part of Europe. And they got Swiss watches and all kinds of great things to buy. And I remember walking down the street after one of these sessions, looking in the store. Here were these beautiful watches, probably $100. And there were $15 there. And I thought, I get a, no, I don't need a watch. Christ is for sure going to come back in the next two weeks. That was 1967, 55 years ago. I'm 70 now. But you know, all that means is that we're 55 years closer. He will come back. God may be slow. He's never late. 